On arrival in my world, for the first time, I spawned in a spruce forest and immediately punched a tree to get some wood, enabling me to get a crafting table, a wooden pick, and then stone. I spotted a nearby village on the mountainside, which was some mad luck and a massive time saver because my first main goal of these 100 days is to find a village. So I go to the village to investigate and end up spotting another village in the distance. And now it's a choice between the two villages. I'd planned to get a trade hall set up, but depending on the layout of the village, certain villages are easier for transporting villagers with boats. Okay, turns out it's actually a choice between three villages. Out of the three of them, first, second and third, I went with the third village. Personally, I think it looks the best for what I've got planned. It was nightfall when I made it to the village and was feeling tired after a day's travel, so I broke into one of the houses and kicked the owner out of their bed so I could sleep. Day two started with me breaking hay blocks around the village. Food is an immediate concern, and these meant I wouldn't starve to death. Next, I harvested some of the nearby spruce trees. I was after saplings, which I planted in the 2x2 variant in order to grow the giant variant spruce trees. They're much better for acquiring large amounts of wood. While I waited for them to grow, I got to work flattening the terrain in preparation for a trade hall. Not for long, because one of the trees had grown and needed harvesting. With easily a stack of logs to spare, I chucked it into the furnace to get cooking into charcoal. By this point, it was getting dark, so I kicked another villager out of the bed so I could sleep. Day 3. I'm continuing to flatten the terrain for where the trade hall is going to go. Once happy with the small amount of land I've flattened, I laid out the dimensions of the trade hall. It's only going to be a small thing with absolutely no aesthetics taken into account. Practicality all the way. And once it's up and running, I can expand as I need. And wood was going to be one of the easiest blocks to use for building the thing. I was able to build up the walls of the trade hall before that day was done. Day 4. The stack of logs I'd put into the furnace had finished cooking. I now had a stack of charcoal. I couldn't imagine it lasting long so I dumped another stack of logs in for smelting. I'd been wanting charcoal because it enabled me to craft torches, some of which went into what will be the interior of the trade hall. Once I put a roof on this thing it's gonna get dark and I don't want mobs spawning. Next I got to work on the roof of the trade hall until I ran out of wood and had to go tree harvesting to replenish my supply. If I hadn't have dumped the second stack of logs into the furnace I probably could have got it done. Oh well, who cares because I like work and I still managed to get the roof finished before the day was up. I also had a visitor in the form of a wandering trader who, surprise surprise, had nothing interesting to sell, so I killed his llamas and stole his leads as retribution. The next day I installed a double gate system for entering and exiting the trade hall without villagers being able to escape, during which a villager actually volunteered himself, which, to be honest, speaks volumes on the general consensus of what the town folk think of my project. Hope he doesn't change his mind, because he's never leaving this place for the rest of his life. One was not going to be enough though, I needed two villagers minimum to get the trade hall operational, so I found another willing volunteer and boated him back to the trade hall, and a third, and a fourth and a fifth villager, all of whom were willing to be part of the project. Though, having said that, there is a paranoid part of me that says they're conspiring against me in that corner over there. Day six, I went around the village collecting all of the beds I could find to put into the trade hall where mostly all of the villagers were. I also brought a sixth villager back to the trade hall who happened to be standing in an easily transportable position in the village. He might have been thinking, wrong place at the wrong time. I personally think right place at the right time. You know what else is at the right place at the right time? Me, right here, because I needed a restock on stone and found my first iron of the world. Coincidence? Yes. Talking of iron, I killed my first golem of the world. It was a shame on one hand, but at least he'll be remembered when he's made into an axe or something. I'm not sure why it took me until the sixth day to run around placing torches around the base when I made these a couple of days ago, but the plan was to make the entire base area free from mob spawns when night rose around. Day 7, I needed to gather wood. When night came, I killed a spider for string and lit up more of the area to expand my territory. Now that I had wood again, I built an animal pen. I wanted to get cows. It won't be long after I've got the trade hall running that I'm going to need librarians. And the next day, I went out and got some. I used the leads the wandering trader had given me to bring them back to the pen. In total, I collected 8 cows. Then, converted some of the hay blocks I'd collected back on day 2 into wheat. I was able to breed them, bypassing the need to create a wheat farm. Next, it was time to 
prepare for trading. I crafted four fletching tables, a composter and a loom using the string I'd gotten from the spider and then went off to harvest logs. The fletches I planned to get were to be our main source of emeralds and they love sticks. Unfortunately for me a thunderstorm occurred and I had to rush to bed before a lightning bolt set my trade hall on fire. Day 9, I woke up to a villager in my face. I hope he hadn't been watching me sleep for free. I could have streamed that. Anyway, it was time to get workers. I added the four fletching tables into the trade hall one at a time so I could ensure each fletcher created would offer me the stick trade, our money maker option. Then I got a farmer specifically with the bread trade. Bought all of the bread and once he'd leveled up, bought all of the pumpkin pie so I wouldn't have to eat the bread anymore. The final villager I turned into a shepherd. Then I gave all of the bread I had on me back to the villagers so they could gobble it up and produce children. Then I did some more trading and was able to purchase a ton of beds from the shepherd. One of the reasons I think the shepherds are great. A lot of people don't like them but they're brilliant for buying beds to put into a trade hall. And the leftover emeralds I was able to use to buy a bow and arrows our first ranged weapon of the game. And I witnessed the bread working faster than expected. As villager breeding already was underway, they have a lot of confidence to do it so openly in front of each other. Keep going like that and this video is going to end up on the hub. The last noticeable thing of the day was killing iron golems. I'm going to regularly kill them as they spawn to steadily increase the amount of iron I have and save them for when I get a toolsmith, armourer and weaponsmith as iron makes levelling them up easy. Day 10. Now that I had fletchers with an insatiable appetite for all things stick related, I was running around the base planting as many giant spawns as I could. Only for so long, the Fletchers could smell the sticks in the air and wouldn't settle down until we traded. The money gained was enough to buy beds from the Shepherd, which went into the trade hall to encourage an increase in population. A population I'd like to turn into librarians, which I need books for. I'd gotten cows for the purpose of leather, now I need to go and grab some sugarcane for paper. After looking moderately hard, I was able to find two, still enough for a farm. And so back at base, I began making a small sugarcane farm for getting enough paper, and dare I say it, rockets further down the line. I didn't finish the farm until the next day, and unless we get cartographers, I can't imagine and I'm going to need more than what this farm at maximum capacity will put out. Then it was time to feed the cows. I'd be doing this on a regular basis until they are ready to be slaughtered give me leather. When pillagers showed up, I was faced with a dilemma. To avoid or attack. I chose attack. My only concern was getting the grunts to kill their captain through unfriendly friendly fire so I wouldn't get the bad omen effect because that would ruin me and the village I'm set up in. The night was spent harvesting trees. Nothing exciting. Day 12, I made a double chest specifically for mob spawner building materials. At some point during these 100 days, I plan to make a mob spawner, and rather than go out of my way to gather all of the materials at once, I'm going to set aside a little at a time so that when I come to make it, I'll have the materials ready to go. As for the trade hall, the next villager on my list of villagers wanted was a weaponsmith. You can buy iron axes from him at novice level if you get the right trade, and rather than use my iron up crafting iron axes, I might as well buy them on the cheap. Now, by this point, the trade hall felt cramped. I laid out the expansion plan and built up the walls. I would have gone through with building the roof, but I ran out of wood. Again. Don't know where I'm going to be able to get enough wood for the roof from. Day 13. I make my first harvest at the sugarcane farm. I replant what I can. It's hardly anything, but it's a start. I finished the trade hall expansion. When night rolled around, I heard one of the most annoying noises at the most inconvenient of times, phantoms. Not only did I have to kill the phantoms, but I also had to put distance between me and the golem I'd been slashing at, because it now wanted to kill me, because, well, I'd been trying to kill it. After that situation was taken care of, I took down the wall between the original trade hall and the expansion, finalising the expansion. It's a good size, should be enough to accommodate the librarians I planned to get. Then I went to bed, not because I was tired, but so I wouldn't have to put up with phantoms. Day 14. I spent the entire day gathering wood. By the time the next day had rolled around, I'd managed to collect 13 and a half stacks of logs, a lot of which went into selling to the Fletchers for emeralds. Also, another worker was added to the trade hall, a toolsmith. Yes, it's thundering in the background, but it's also raining, so I don't have to be concerned about anything catching fire. The toolsmith I got up to expert level and was able to purchase my first diamond tool of the game, a diamond shovel. I bought three, for no reason. 
The rest of the day was spent doing odd jobs around the base, killing iron golems, harvesting and replanting the sugar cane and breeding the cows before I slept the night away to get rid of both the thunder and the rain. Day 16 began with some terrain flattening around the trade hall in case I wanted to expand for a third time. Really, it was just an excuse to use my new diamond shovel, and I'm sure I'm going to find an excuse to go mining next, because I got the toolsmith to master level where I was able to buy diamond pickaxes with unbreaking too. Oh look, some mountains next to my base. I think it would be a great idea to go looking for some surface level iron. Not really, like I said a moment ago, just an excuse to put my diamond pick to use. Unfortunately for me, I was gonna have to put up with the mining blue balls because only snow and blue ice could be seen up on the mountains and the surrounding terrain boasted no surface level iron. Looks like I'm gonna have to be making do with killing golems. I got a second toolsmith on day 17, I'm hunting for a diamond axe, ideally I would have got that first because of all the trees I have to chop down for money. Thankfully this one offered diamond axes at expert level, efficiency 3 no less so I was going to be speeding through those trees. So I ran around the base planting more trees and then spent all night chopping them down with the new axe, it was a heck of a lot nicer. Nice enough that I had no problem spending all of day 18 tree harvesting. The only exciting thing to happen, quote unquote, was when a skeleton almost killed me, but I ran away before that could happen. Day 19, I traded much of my hard earned wood with Fletchers and then guess what? I spent the rest of the day tree harvesting. I needed more wood. Day 20, got my weaponsmith to expert level where I was surprised to find he would also sell me diamond axes as well as my toolsmith. These had arm breaking 2 instead of efficiency 3. Killed the iron golems around the trade hall to get enough iron to get the weaponsmith that final level up to master level, where I was now able to buy diamond swords. And the trading didn't stop there, no, I got myself an armourer and was able to trade him all the way up from novice level to master level, where I was able to get full diamond armour. And that is how you go from no armour to full diamond armour. There won't be any skeletons nearly killing me in the future. Day 21, I was on that 9 to 5 grind, trading with the Fletchers again, I keep spending all of my money, so I have to keep working for more. And as nice as my salary was, I needed it to be higher. The solution? More Fletchers, all with the stick trade. Day 22, I made an anvil. Now I could combine an efficiency 3 axe from the toolsmith with an unbreaking 2 diamond axe from the weaponsmith to get the best of both. Then I ran around the base planting about 5 stacks of spruce saplings in the 2x2 two two large spruce formation. Realising I hadn't traded with Fletchers at all today, went into the trade hall to wake them up. As you can imagine, they love me for that. The last thing I did for the day was harvest the sugar cane. As you can see, there are a lot more of these guys than the 8 we started out with. I thought it was about time I sent them to a better place. The only ones to survive the massacre were the babies, but only because they wouldn't drop anything when they died. After all of that, I got a stack and a half of leather. Nice, but honestly, I expected getting double this amount, so not nice. In case I think about breeding the cows again once the babies grow up, I travel to the other two villagers we'd seen on day one in order to steal their hay. By the time I got back, I was greeted by what looked to be Fangorn Forest and my base. There are trees everywhere. The next day, I made the effort of trapping the worker villagers next to their job site blocks because being trapped in a building wasn't bad enough for them. Now they can't move or sleep, only trade. And then, I'm sure many of you will have guessed what I'm going to do next. Yes, I spent the rest of the day tree harvesting. In fact, I harvested trees straight all the way until day 29, gathering stacks and stacks of logs. It was a grindy process, but to be honest, that's how I view the first 100 days of a Minecraft world to be. Once we have the best possible gear and the ability to fly, the game opens up so much. These logs are our ticket to a better life, and sadly, I don't think they're going to last long. Day 30. Using paper from the sugarcane farm and leather from the cows, I was able to make lecterns. All of those lecterns went into the trade hall for gaining librarians. I went through each of the librarians one by one, checking their trades. The ones I wanted, I bought from, locking their trades in, and trapped them into their cubbyhole next to their respective lectern. The others, I ignored. 
I tried to put what enchantments I could onto my tools and armor, and then it was over to the Fletchers. What you've got to realize is money and XP don't grow on trees, even if I trade literal trees for money and XP. Then I removed all of the lecterns of the librarians I didn't want, so they'd no longer be librarians, and I'd be able to effectively re-roll on their trades when I reinstated them with the title of librarian. And that's exactly what I did on day 31. I put the lecterns back into the trade hall to see what enchantments we got next. I used the same method as yesterday, going through the librarians one at a time, buying from the ones I wanted to keep and trapping them next to their job site blocks, and ignoring the ones I didn't want to keep. And again, I combined what enchantments I could at the anvil. Day 32 would be when I'd say the real grinding for enchantments started. In fact, it's all I did literally. So I'm going to summarize these next 20 days. Yes, you heard that right, 20 days. That's how long it took me to get all of the enchanted books I wanted and to put them onto my tools and armor. When I said earlier in the video I considered these first 100 days to be for grinding for good gear, I genuinely meant it and it revolves a lot around villager trading, specifically librarians. And as anyone who's had dealings with these fellas know, enchanted books are expensive and at this point in the game particularly challenging to afford. During the process I got myself a load of masons because they offer multiple cheap trades and are great for boosting XP quickly. That's what I use them for, to farm XP. I also had to expand the trade hall for a third time to facilitate more librarians. Turns out the size of the trade hall I thought was enough actually wasn't. I also had to re-enchant a second sword after enchanting a first sword, seeing as one of the main enchantments I had left, looting three, couldn't actually be added as a result of it being too expensive according to the anvil. Personally, I'd like to have been the judge of that, but shit happens. And seeing as looting three is an essential enchantment for when we kill blazes, I had to spend time, money and XP getting a second sword. Also, recall when I said I didn't think our log supply was going to last long? It didn't. Uh, they ran out halfway through the process and they were essential for funding my extravagant spending, meaning a lot of my time was devoted to tree harvesting. The final hurdle of all this grinding was finding the one last enchantment I wanted but couldn't seem to get, an efficiency book. One of the key enchantments I desperately wanted on my tools. I was aiming for efficiency 5, but I told myself the lowest I'd settle for would be efficiency 3 books, because buying 4 efficiency 3 books makes 1 efficiency 5 book, and that wasn't the end of the world. After days of trying, in the end, I... Uh, I settled with an efficiency 1 book, the worst I could have gone. I had to buy 16 of these books to get one efficiency 5 book, which both cost lots in emeralds and XP when combining them at the anvil. All in all, it was a painstaking process. But on day 53, I could finally say I'd done it. Fully enchanted diamond gear. I'll talk you through what we've got. A diamond helmet with aqua affinity, respiration 3, mending, unbreaking 3 and blast protection 4. A diamond chest plate with fire protection 4, mending and unbreaking 3. Diamond leggings with protection 4, mending and unbreaking 3. Diamond boots with projectile protection 4, unbreaking 3. Feather falling 4, mending and depth strider 3. A diamond sword with looting 3, mending, unbreaking 3 and sharpness 5. I would have put a couple of other enchantments onto it, namely Sweeping Edge, but once again it was apparently too expensive and I really couldn't be bothered to go through the ordeal of trying for a third sword. A Diamond Axe with Fortune 2, Unbreaking 3, Mending, Efficiency 5 and Smite 5. Fortune 2 came with the axe from the Toolsmith and I didn't think I'd benefit from having Fortune 3 on it, so I just sort of left Fortune on it. A Diamond Pickaxe with Unbreaking 3, Mending, Silk Touch and Efficiency 5. A Diamond Shovel with Fortune 2, again the same predicament as the axe, unbreaking 3, mending and efficiency 5, a bow with power 5, flame, punch 2, unbreaking 3 and infinity because it's better than having mending and you can't change my mind, and finally a shield with mending and unbreaking 3. And guess what I did to celebrate? Harvested trees obviously, not really, I just didn't have any wood whatsoever. Day 54 I was on the lookout for lava. I found it not far from the base. I turned all the way to obsidian and mined every last block of the stuff. Then I made a nether portal and headed through to see what my nether spawn was like. It's in a nether waste biome high up out of the way, it's not the worst in the world. 
any gold nugget or blocks I saw close by I mined. I needed gold to prevent piglin attacks. The great thing was, because I had silk touch on my pig, I could smell each ore block individually in a furnace for one gold ingot each. Day 55, I was looking for a fortress. The next step of progression is to find and kill blazes for blaze rods and grab nether warts so we can find a way to the end and get into the potion brewing. Surprisingly, it didn't take long. I found a fortress that same day. Killed a couple of blazes I came across for our first four blaze rods of the world. Four blaze rods from two blazes? Dream luck? No. That's the power of a looting three sword. And I put that power to good use when I found a spawner. And with the great armor I had, even without fire res potion, I was able to camp the spawner and hand kill all blazes that spawned. The next day I was still farming blazes for an abundance of rods. In all honesty, I was getting carried away, and it meant I ended up with an overabundance because I got over two stacks of them. Blaze rods obtained, it was time to find the nether ward, and I had a bit of a tough time doing so because of how many mobs wanted to kill me. I don't know what the issue was, it's not like any of them are going to use the nether ward for anything, so surely I should have free access to it, right? Despite their best efforts, I ended up finding nether wart in a chest, and I could have called it a day there, but I wanted to find the growing room for where I could get my grubby little hands on more, and as you can see, I did. Day 57, I was making a direct road from the blaze spawner to my base portal, meaning I'd be able to travel to and from either as I pleased, but then I realised halfway through I'd read the coordinates wrong and had been travelling in a completely the opposite direction so I had to head back to the blaze spawner and start again. During the process of road making I really wanted to kill this zombie piglin that kept getting in the way but the only thing that was saving him was me being afraid he'd call his friends for backup so I led him into a small room I dug out because I knew he'd want to follow me to invade my personal space and then trapped him with the blocks showcasing my superiority. Unfortunately for this guy I didn't have the same patience. Frustrations aside, by the end of the day I made it back to my base portal. Day 58 and I get myself some clerics because some of them sell enderpearls. I didn't have the emeralds to level them up, so I planned to come back to them later. Instead, I gathered sand, smelted it into glass, turned them into bottles, and alongside nether wart and blaze powder made some awkward potions. Then it was back into the nether to look for a basalt delta biome. I'm after magma cubes. They drop magma cream and combining said magma cream with awkward potions make potions of fire resistance. I find the biome but I'm a bit high up, practically in the nether ceiling, so I have the great idea of mining out an area for magma cubes to spawn. Day 59. It wasn't working and I didn't want to keep increasing the size when all I wanted was a single magma cube. So I went down to the y equals 60 to 70 range and explored the terrain for an encounter. I found one after about a minute and because of looting three meant I was guaranteed a magma queen drop. Back at base I combined the magma cream and the three awkward potions I'd made to create three potions of fire resistance. The nether had just become about 60% less dangerous. And then, as I wanted to level up the clerics so they'd hopefully sell me ender pearls, I got to work tree harvesting. And that's basically all I did for the next day too, though I did stop to trade some of that wood with the fletchers for a profit. Day 61 I had enough money to trade with the clerics, although I got distracted by their cloaks. Is that a creeper on the back of them? I honestly don't know if that's common knowledge. Never noticed it before. Never. I leveled up the clerics best I could before running out of money, and some of the redstone I got from them I used to increase the durability time of my fire res potions from 3 minutes all the way up to 8 minutes. That's a long time. If I was to fall in any sort of lava, as long as I've got one of those on me, there's no way I'm dying. After that I traded with the fletchers to get enough money to buy enderpose from one of the three clerics. Only one because the other two weren't offering the enderpo trade. Sad times. I was still able to make eyes of ender and an ender chest, just not as many eyes as I would have liked. Now that I owned an ender chest, I started stacking it with useful items I may need when away from the base, seeing as I'm going to make sure I always have it in my inventory from now on. Day 62, the cleric's trade had reset and I was able to buy more ender pearls. I turned them all into eyes of ender and at this point I was almost ready to try and find the stronghold. First, I needed to find an ocean. Earlier in this video I'd said I'd make a mob spawner at some point, and now was that point. I needed gunpowder for rockets for when I get the elytra. I chose to build the spawner above an ocean so that the spawn rates are working at the utmost efficiency. The 
The next day was focused all on the mob spawner. I was trying to get it built as quick as possible, but then it started thundering and I went to bed from fear of a fire breakout. Day 64 I got the mob spawner finished, only because instead of making a triple layered spawner like usual, I made it a single layer. Reason being, I underestimated the amount of blocks it would take to build, and FYI, this was as fun as it looks. And then it was the moment of truth, does it work? It does, but for some reason it's ridiculously slow. I don't know why, having it be a single layered spawner versus a triple layered one shouldn't drop the rates by this much. Something was definitely ruining the efficiency rates, something that I just couldn't figure out. Whatever it was, I wasn't going to spend the time figuring it out, I just stayed until I got enough gunpowder to make a decent amount of rockets for when we're in the end. Talking of which, it was now time to find the stronghold. After some back and forth Eye of Ender action, I think I found the location, so it was just a case of mining down. I was surprised the Eyes of Ender had already located the stronghold, but then I was over a thousand blocks away from spawn, so maybe I shouldn't have been surprised. Day 65, I mined down into a large cave. I was hoping the stronghold had openly merged with portions of the cave, but after some exploration, I couldn't see anything. And this is where relying on your ears can save a lot of time. I'd heard silverfish near to where I'd been mining downwards, so I mined into one of the cave walls, and moments later I'd found the portal room and it's all thanks to the silverfish I never thought I'd say that it was unlucky to find the portal frame with zero eyes of ender already in place but it was okay I prepared for this scenario I put a pumpkin on my head because the Endermen genuinely scare me more than the dragon does uh, they were the reason I failed my last attempt at making this video So if having reduced visibility was the difference between me living through this fight, I, I was going to take it. With nothing left to do, I jumped into the portal and arrived in the end dimension. I got lucky with the spawn under a lip of the main island where the dragon couldn't get to me. I tunnelled into the island and took my pumpkin head off. I know I just gave you a speech about why I was wearing the thing, but my tunnel was two blocks high. So even if I was to look an enderman dead in the eye, it wouldn't be able to get me. When I went up into the open of the island's surface, however, then I put it back on. It was simply a case of taking out the end crystals one at a time. This wasn't a speed run, so I could take as much time as was needed. Suspicious I'd taken all of the end crystals out, I hit the dragon and noticed his health didn't regenerate, confirming for a certainty that all the crystals were indeed gone. Then it was just a case of firing arrow after arrow at the dragon. Most of my arrows missed, the wind kept blowing them off course, but with infinity on my bow it didn't matter. It was only a matter of time until the dragon's health hit zero. That is the dragon conquered. And a boatload of XP I would have liked to have had access to when I was enchanting my tools. Using the torch method I was able to obtain the dragon's head, a trophy of this hardcore world, and because I'd killed the dragon, an end gateway portal had spawned on the outer edge of the island. I went through and looked over the land for an end city. I couldn't see one. If you're wondering why I took the pumpkin off after publicly stating that I was afraid of the Enderman, it's because without a dragon to deal with at the same time, I was confident in my ability to not look an Enderman in the eye. The entire day was spent searching for an end city. Up until now, I thought they were fairly common, but maybe they weren't actually as common as I thought. I went far enough out that I found a second gate portal and then a few minutes later, another one. I know this is highly irrational after a day searching for an end city, but I was actually starting to think that my world had spawned without end cities. Of course, that wasn't the case because I found one the next day and I questioned why I'd ever thought that. Of course, there's going to be end cities included. <laughs> Thankfully, this one had a boat, meaning I'd be able to get the elytra. Upon exploration, it was nice to find a lot of shulkers. I killed every one I came across, seeing as for every two shulker shells collected, I'd be able to make a shulker box, granting us an additional 27 slots of storage. For the most part, things went smoothly. The one scare I did have was when I was getting too cocky fighting shulkers on the outside of an end building and fell off the side. As you can see I paused briefly to gather my thoughts uh, but by this point I realised there was nothing I could do so I actually resigned myself to death but I somehow survived. Just feather falling 100% saved my life. After that I made getting to the boat my priority. 
although I did find some chests along the way and discovered my first diamonds of the world. Day 70, I made it to the boat and got the elytra. The elytra is to the end what fire resistance potions are for the nether, a massive safety net. While at the boat, I picked up the dragon's head on the front of the ship and then it was time to call it a day. I wanted to get back to the base so I could enchant the elytra and because of the rocket I brought along, it was quick work. Obviously I skipped the credits, Mojang, I love you, I really do, and this is a great game but nobody's got time to sit through those credits. Back in the overworld I'd been sent back to the world spawn and that would have been a pain if I hadn't have been able to fly, but I can fly so it doesn't matter. Day 71, I put Mend in and I'm breaking three on my Elytra, otherwise I wouldn't have it for long. Then, using a Mason to farm XP, I repaired it back to full durability. With the Shulker Shells collected, I had enough to craft ten Shulker Boxes. Because I'll be keeping them inside my Ender Chest, which I keep in my inventory at all times, I've basically added 270 additional inventory slots. Though, I needed to make space in my Ender Chest for them, so transferred many of the useful items in my Ender Chest into one of the Shulkers. Then, I flew over to the mob spot wanted to grind for gunpowder because it was my only means of getting the stuff. I still don't know why it's so slow, but until I create a viable alternative, I'm stuck with it. By the time day 72 rolled around, I'd gotten an abysmal 28 gunpowder. I might actually have been better running around the terrain during the night searching out creepers manually. Still, it got me an additional 86 rockets, more than enough for now. Back at base, my chest plate went on in place of the elytra, a habit I'm going to try and make a point of sticking to, and then went into the nether. I'm back here again because I want to upgrade my tools and armour to full netherite. It meant having to mine down into the depths of the nether to y equals 15, where I hear ancient debris is most common. Twice I came across a lava lake and had to change directions, but on the third time I made it down to Y equals 15 and set up a base of operations, a mining hub if you will, and consisted of my shulker boxes for storing blocks. The tried and tested method of efficiently hunting down ancient debris is to use TNT, but as you know I don't have access to large supplies of TNT because of the gunpowder issue, so I was going to have to strip mine for it. Which, in all honesty, isn't as bad as it sounds, it's just longer. Though having said that, it didn't take long to find my first piece, and a few minutes later, another two of them. And I think that's all it comes down to, patience. Days 73 to 75 was just strip mining for ancient debris. I'd go as far as I could in one direction, collecting any ancient debris I might come across until I hit either a wall of lava that wasn't worth trying to get past because of the effort it would take, or another biome where insta mining wasn't as successful. Then I'd run back to my base of operations, store all of the blocks I'd inevitably collected while tunneling through the terrain in my shulker boxes, and then start another tunnel, running parallel to the previous but two blocks away. The goal was to obtain 32 ancient debris. That was how much I needed to upgrade all of my armour and tools to full netherite. And although it doesn't sound like a lot, ancient debris is hard to come by. It was lucky I'd stored both the anvil and the diamonds found in the end city in my ender chest because I needed both to repair my diamond pick more than once. Alongside ancient debris, I was making the conscious effort to collect all of the gold nugget ore blocks I came across seeing as you need them to craft netherite ingots. Unfortunately, my ancient debris hunting came to an end on day 76, as the anvil was saying it was too expensive to repair my pickaxe, despite being able to do so 15 minutes prior. So I packed up and returned to base. Day 77, I traded with the villagers to repair my tools, specifically my pick. Then I spent the rest of the day harvesting trees so I'd have logs available for trading with Fletchers next time I needed to come back and repair the pick. Although I did have a break in the middle to smelt four of the ancient debris collected, if I wasn't able to repair my pickaxe at an anvil, I might as well upgrade it to netherite to increase its durability for when we go mining again. The next day, with fully enchanted netherite pickaxe in hand, I went back to my ancient debris searching spot and began again. I found two almost immediately, a good sign that I hoped was a good omen. I had five left to go, and believe it or not, it turned out that it was a good omen, because I was able to find the additional five that same day. When I got back to the base the next day, I excitedly put the remaining 28 pieces of ancient debris into smelt. While I waited, I traded with the Fletchers to repair my netherite pick. By then, the ancient debris had finished smelting, and alongside the gold I'd said we needed, crafted seven netherite ingots and used those ingots to upgrade the seven remaining pieces of gear to full netherite. Here it is, full Balenciaga clothing. 
Now that I had OP gear, had beaten the Ender Dragon and had an enchanted Elytra, it was time to take on a project that I feel is a rite of passage to becoming an official hardcore player. All the greats do it, and if you don't do it, are you really a hardcore Minecrafter? Find and drain an ocean monument. After some flying about, I found one, but it was getting dark, so I flew to a nearby village and kicked a villager out of his bed so I could sleep. It's nice to see things are still the same after 79 days of playing. The following day, however, I realised I didn't have any temporary blocks on me for planning out the dimensions of the amount of ocean I wanted to drain, so it was back to the base to pick up a load of netherrack. Flew back to the ocean monument, towered up from the ocean floor, and then bridged across the water towards the middle of the monument. Or try to. With the number of guardians in the area, it was difficult to get near. It meant I had to change strategy and create walls to hide behind for refuge if things got too spicy to handle. It wasn't all one-sided. When the guardians came near to the surface, I could snipe them with arrows, then bridge further along a few blocks while the coast was clear and repeat the process. Day 81, I'd made it to the centre of the monument and was now going to bridge out 74 blocks in all four directions. Why 74 blocks? I don't know, it seemed like a good size. After the bridging was done, I began working on the outline of the perimeter. The shape I've opted for is a circle. And after a quick fly around the draining area due to concerns about the size, those concerns were realised. It's too small for my liking. The solution was to extend the four bridges by a further 20 blocks in their respective directions. So now the draining site would be 90 floor blocks out from the centre in all four directions. Day 82, I restarted the circle outline now that we're working from a larger radius and worked on it for the entire day and a big portion of the next day. Now that is a much better size. On the last quarter segment, I miscalculated and it didn't add up with the rest of the circle, so I had to redo a portion of it. And then it was complete. You can't see from here because of the size of the circle, but that last part is definitely not symmetrical with the other three quarters of the outline. What is noticeable is how much of a monumental task this is going to be. I've never drained one of these, but even I can tell it's going to be a lot of work. Luckily, there is a desert and a badlands biome on the doorstep of the project for sourcing all of the sand we're going to need. But I'm going to have to wait until mining fatigue wears off before heading over. The next morning I was feeling fresh and energetic now that the mining fatigue had dissipated. I was gathering as much sand as I could. There's no chance of getting this project finished before these 100 days are up, that's crazy, but I can get a mental estimate for how much sand might be needed for the project. The night time was less productive. Mobs spawned everywhere. I didn't put torches down, one, because I'd have to keep replacing them when I shoveled the sand they sat on, and two, I was so desperate for gunpowder I opted for killing individual creepers to source my need for the stuff. Day 85. I was still collecting sand. I thought I'd be able to fill the shulkers quickly, but I was naive. Even with an efficiency 5 netherite shovel, filling 9 shulkers to the brim wasn't going to be done in a day. And I almost broke my shovel. I didn't even realise how low the durability had gotten. Got the shovel repaired with a bit of trading, then flew back to the digging site and continued gathering sand. Day 87, again, I spend the day shoveling sand. Day 88, I finished filling the 9 shulker boxes full with sand. It was almost time to begin the draining process. Almost, because I needed to swim to the bottom of the ocean and remove all of the foliage in the way. I didn't know if it would make a difference, but I was kind of worried sand blocks would break when landing on these from above. Though I didn't actually know for sure, so uh, after I realised how much work it was going to be, I stopped and began the draining process. But then I had phantoms show up and be annoying, so I went to bed. Next day, I got back to placing sand. I was working my way slowly around the perimeter's edge. During the process, I found out that kelp does indeed make a difference. Sand blocks would break when landed on them from above, so sand placing was on hold until I'd removed all of the kelp from the ocean floor. The process, although slightly long-winded, wasn't that bad. Aqua Affinity, Respiration 3 and Depth Strider definitely helped. The only dicey part was when I got too close to the monument itself and the guardians targeted me for attacks. Day 90, I'm still breaking kelp and still being attacked by guardians. Honestly, they need to get a life. Bloody kelp protectors. I found an underwater ravine, and all I could wonder was how much sand was it going to take to drain. I don't know about you, but I'd say this looks like a kelp-free zone. The only kelp I left was on and directly around the ocean monument where the guardians swam. That's a bridge we're going to cross later. At the moment, the perimeter of the circle was clear, so I could outline that with sand. And I'm pleased to say that I got through an entire shulker box worth of sand. 1,728 blocks of the stuff 
and it's <laughs> it's a drop in the bucket compared to what we're going to need. Days 92, 93, 94 and 95 all I did was place sand blocks but I did it on day 96 six and a half shulker blocks of sand later from when we started I'd gone round the entire perimeter. Days 97 to 98, I still had one and a half shulker boxes of sand left to empty. Originally, I was going to fill the entire draining area with sand and then dig the monument back out. But uh, after estimating how much sand that's going to take, I'm going to separate it into sections and then drain it with a sponge. Uh, but that still means an insane amount of sand needs to be placed. And so the next phase of the draining plan was to run horizontal or vertical, depending on which way you look at it from, strips three blocks apart across the entire draining site. Obviously, I didn't have the sand to do that now, but it's good to see how far nine shulkers worth of sand will get me. My prediction? Mm, including the nine I'd gone through? I think the project will take about 60 shulker boxes of sand to drain. Day 99, one away from our first landmark day. I was back at the base trading with masons to replenish the durability of both my shovel and elytra. Because I planned to collect tens of thousands of blocks of sand, I bought a couple more diamond shovels to use as backup shovels. Then, after some trading with the Fletchers, I purchased another three. Here we are, the big 100. We've done it. We've hit 100 days of Minecraft Hardcore. Not an excuse to stop working. I put more fletching tables into the trade hall to get additional fletchers specifically with the stick trade. In the next 100 days, I'm going to need to do more trading with these guys and I want to be able to trade a larger quantity of sticks at one time. I also bought another three diamond shovels from our toolsmith. That's eight backup shovels in total. And then the rest of the day was spent tree harvesting. What else? And there it is. That's the sunrise on day 101. We've done it. If you want to see me go to 200 days, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. I'm trying to get to 60 subscribers by the end of the year, and with your help, yes you, I know we can do it. Alright, bye!